Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to thy holy church the care and nurture of its people, enlighten with thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, <coughs> that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth, they may worship thee and serve thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we have actually, I think, exhausted history. Any questions about the history of the Anglican Church before we move on to polity? Great. So you go to the polity slide, please. So polity sounds like police, right? And in a, a way, that's what it is. Polity is the way that the church is governed, all right? And uh, politics comes from the same root word, and policy comes from the same word. Polity is the way that churches are organized and then the way that they are run. Because of our history, we are uniquely organized, and, and that comes from the cultural uh, influences that affected the church as it grew in England, which were different than the cultural influences that, that, that influenced the church in Rome, as it was a, a, a church of an empire, or the church of the Protestants in Germany or Switzerland, where their particular cultural background also fed into how it was that they set up and how they ran their churches. So the English church is based on common law, okay? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Roman church versus the English church, not to make one better than the other, but to kind of explain how they're different. And then I'll also talk a little bit how the Protestant churches are organized uh, as well, and how that's different than what we do, so that you can understand how it is that the Anglican church is set up and, and why I personally believe that it's a really beautiful and just way for a church to operate and a good way for us to, to understand you know, how God's love reflects to his people by the way the church reflects its organization and especially its job in reconciliation back to the people. So we go back to the laws, to the first set of laws given was the, the, the laws of Hammurabi uh, in the Babylonian Empire. And then we had the laws of Justinian in the Roman Empire. And throughout history, there's always been people that have put together laws and organized a society according to the laws. And we do know that societies don't work without organization and without laws, then we have anarchy. And anarchy turns into what we had during the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, in which, you know, everybody's the king, everybody's a god, and everybody's individual jealousies or anger or grievances get brought against everybody else, and nobody is safe. And Historically, whenever we've had that kind of anarchy, it is followed immediately by dictatorship, right? The French Revolution is followed by Napoleon, and then the Russian Revolution is followed immediately by uh, first Lenin and then Stalin, and then finally all the dictators all that have succeeded them down through Putin. So the idea of allowing mankind to operate under anarchy has never been a good option. I mean, God has given us from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, he gave Adam and Eve organization, said, this is your garden. It's not a forest, okay? It's not a prairie. It's a garden. It has rows. It has trees. It has plants and you are supposed to take care of it and the animals that are in it. That's your job, so you have, you, know, you have a duty that's given to you. And then I'm gonna give you one more law that says, I don't want you to eat of this particular tree because it's the tree of the fruit of good and evil. 
And so from the very beginning, God gave us organization and he gave us laws. All right. As from the beginning, mankind disobeys laws. That's what we do. It's what Adam did, it's what Eve did, and then Adam did. And then immediately they blame somebody else. Okay. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. Who knows who the snake blamed, but he blamed somebody too. All right, and so the nature of mankind is not to take responsibility for himself. And so we live in a world where we or have organization and where we, that organization leads to laws and polity, policies that, that help people to get along with one another. Now, some polities are more strict and punitive and some are conciliatory. The Roman Empire operated in lots of different societies, different cultures, different countries that they overran. And then they imposed Roman law on top of it. Right? And Roman law is really simple. What is Roman is right, and what you do is wrong. Okay, That's just the way that it is. That's the way the empire works, right? And you know, you will do things our way. It's why throughout history, when we have the church intersecting with empire, you have persecutions because first the Jews and then, and then after that the Christians weren't willing to live with all of the consequences of imperial law where everything is closely defined, okay? And where if you break the law, the, the goal of the law is to punish, all right, and to, and to dissuade people, other people, from breaking the law. One of the reasons that Jesus was crucified, right, crucifixion was reserved for terrorists. It was the worst way that you could be put to death. Treason. I mean, you know, today we're very careful about, you know, despite the fact we have old Sparky here in Florida, the electric chair that works most of the time, generally we try to be very humane when we have capital punishment, when somebody's put to death. You know, they, they have a needle with chemicals put into them so that they don't suffer, okay? Um, even the guillotine was brought out because it was supposed to be the most humane possible way to kill somebody. It was supposed to be gentle. But it was made by a doctor, Dr. Guillotine, and named after him. Yes. And the idea was that if you could cut the neck off, you cut the nerves off in the brain, and there's no suffering. Okay. We don't know that that's the case, because none of those people were ever able to say after the fact <laughs> <laughs> how much they suffered. All right. But Dr. Guillotine was very certain that it was the most humane possible way. It, the opposite is true. In the, in the Roman Empire. The reason Jesus is crucified is it's a warning to other terrorists and other insurgents. And what do we see in Israel right now, right? You killed 110 of our people, we're going to kill 20,000 of your people. Okay? We're going we're gonna to make a deterrent. It's going to be so awful that nobody will ever think about doing this again. That, that's the way that empires run. Right, and that's the way the Roman Empire ran. And so Jesus was put to death on the cross because it was painful, because it was slow, because it was supposed to be a warning to the other Jews that anybody else who dares to oppose the authority of the Roman government is going to suffer terribly. Okay. So when the Roman church co-opted the empire, okay, uh, remember we talked in the history about uh, Constantine and his mother Helena. And Helena was a British woman that was the mother of Constantine who became the emperor of Rome. She was a Christian and she converted her son to be a Christian. And so when the emperor became a Christian, they went from persecuting Christians to making Christianity the law of the empire. Okay. 
It didn't just become the religion of the empire, it became the law of the empire. And when we had councils, when there were disagreements within the church, it was the emperor who called the council, not the pope or a bishop, it, you know, because the Roman church was tied so closely to the empire, as long as the empire was allowed that the emperor was really the person in charge of organizing it. Now the laws of the Church of Rome are organized as the laws of the Empire of Rome are organized. And so we know that we all have sin in our lives. The job of a Roman priest is to condemn the sin, the sin and dictate the punishment. Right? It's why for those of us who were raised in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, we were herded into the church by our, our classes. You know, snap, snap, you get on your knees, snap, snap, you say your prayer, snap, snap. The line starts going to the priest in the confessional. You start making up sins so that, you know, <laughs> because, because it's seven years old, you haven't done anything particularly bad. But especially we did adultery, you know, because we were trying to act like grown-ups all the time, right? And so that was our sin. And I'm sure the priests were laughing like crazy behind the, the screen. But we were made up our sins, and we got our, you know, two Our Fathers, 17 Hail Marys, and a couple of Glory Bees, and then we were going to be okay. But the nature of this was that the priest's job was to define, define the sin, convict you of your sin, and dole out the punishment. Right. And then the punishment was supposed to be what deterred you from do doing those sins ever again. And, that, and, you know, that's still the way that it is. That's, that's how the sacrament of confession works inside the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, it's, it's a, a way that works. It's a way that has been successful. And so it's, you know, I don't... I don't criticize it, but I grew up with it, and I understand that there are other ways to deal with things. You know, I, I know that I lived in a house that was very strict, and I get corporal punishment immediately for everything that we ever did wrong. Okay, it or never think or think about doing right, um, and and it never kept me from doing wrong. As I raised my own kids, I tried to, to be more persuasive with them to help them to understand what they were doing right, and why it was wrong and why they would be better off to do it differently and what are the consequences in your own life when you do those things that are not godly and that are sinful. That didn't work very well in all of them. It worked okay in some. And it didn't work. So we, you know, we're all built differently, and so we all need different systems around us. But for the people that 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 are responsive to the idea that sin causes you to be unhappy, I don't need to punish you and beat you up because you sin. That sin has its own consequence. It makes you unhappy. It makes you guilty. It separates you from people that you love. It breaks your relationships. The consequence of sin is its own punishment, right? And so the English church is based on the government that they had, which is common law. And while the goal of the law of the Roman church was to define what is wrong and to punish it so that you would deter other people from doing it, the law in, in a common law country is built around precedent. You know, what's happened before? What have we done about that before? And reconciliation. How do we bring the person who has been alienated by their sin back into proper fellowship with the church? Okay. And that's a different way of doing it. It's a way that's attractive to me. All right, it's a way that I respond to, all right, and and so I'm really attracted to this model of a cultural 
adaptation of the sacrament of penance that says, you know, yes, you know, when you sin, you know you did bad, and you feel bad for having done it. And sometimes the, the sins that we do in our lives are, you know, cause us to be sick, <coughs> cause us to be sad, cause us to be guilty. There's consequence that, that comes internally from these sins. And so the question is, how do we take these people that are already suffering for their sin, assure them that God loves them and forgives them, and then help them to separate from their life that led them to sin and to be strengthened in the life that they can have within the church, which leads them to virtue and to peace. So we have the same sacrament, right? And that same sacrament gets, a, gets deployed in a different way, and it's successful with different kinds of people. Now, as the Protestant church got engaged, the, you know, the nature of the Protestant church in Germany and in Switzerland and in France as it, and in Holland as it developed was to get away from the judgment of a clerical body and to get into the judgment of the people in the church, right? And so, you know, if you're a good Baptist and they catch you drinking, playing cards, and smooching that girl, right, what are they going to do? They're going to shun you, okay, and expel you until you can show your proper penitence and come in and beg the church, the whole church, for forgiveness. Right. That's that's another way of applying law, right? Where you know where the the disapproval of the body of the people, okay, is the deterrent from you know nobody wants to be shamed in front of their friends and their family. Nobody wants to be excluded from church, and so that's a you know that's another way in which law gets applied in the case of sin so that people will be reluctant to sin again. And then, of course, as you go through different <coughs> flavors of religion, uh, Christianity, you have more or less of the Roman, the, you know, the, the, uh, the Anglican or the Protestant kinds of culture relative to governing and relative to sin that is mixed and mashed and, you know, for the particular population that they have. So not all Protestant groups do the shaming thing, you know, but, but they don't have that, that sacrament of reconciliation that we have either, right? So, so there's, you know, there's a spectrum of ways that God deals with his people. The English church wants to do it as reconciliation and strengthening of the environment in which the person lives so they can be part of the church and live in virtue and have the peace that comes from living a goodly life and a godly life. Does that make sense for everybody? Questions about that? Now, from that comes the way the church is organized, right? The government of England was different than a Roman Empire. And it was different than feudalism in Germany or in France or in Holland, right? In England, you had a king and you had nobles. But the king didn't have his own money, right? Couldn't, couldn't go to war on his own. Didn't, he had some army, but not enough. And he had some money, but not enough, right? And so when he wanted to go to war or he wanted to, to do something, you know, expand his kingdom, he had to go to his nobles and bargain with them, okay? That's different than the feudalism of Europe. In Europe, you had whoever the strongest prince was, the strongest nobleman, took control. It was also that way in Japan. Anybody watch Shogun, right? You know, the whole idea of shogun is it's a feudal system. You have all these lords that have regional power, and then 
your, the shogun is trying to, you know, t be the strongest one and take, o take over and subjugate all the other kingdoms, right? So that he can be the emperor. And that's the way that the continent of Europe went. But in England, right, they, they had the Magna Carta, which was a constitution based on biblical principles of the rights of man and the dignity of man. And they organized a, uh, an assembly of the noblemen at first, ultimately also included the House of, uh, of the, it's the House of Lords and the House of Commons, the common people as well, but originally just the House of Lords, right? So that the king could justify what he wanted to do and get the approval of the lords and get their buy-in so that they would all be able to go together. Okay. And so instead of having a church that had a pope that sat on top of it who was the king of all the feudal religious lords, which were the cardinals and the bishops, right? you got a presiding bishop, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury, whose job it was to organize the meetings and to be the guy that wrapped the gavel and decided who was going to talk next. But the decisions, chairman. presiding chairman, but the decisions were not made by the Archbishop of Canterbury. They were made by the consensus of the people. Right. Now, coincidentally, that's how the apostles did it. Right. We had our vestry meeting here last week, right, and we had uh, an, art, an item that came up uh, before the vestry, and we had a couple of people that opposed it, but there was a strong majority in favor. And even though we had a strong majority, what I said was, well, we're not going to do that because it doesn't do any good for the majority to get their way and to alienate the minority. When the apostles got together, if they didn't all agree unanimously, they didn't make anything a policy or a dogma, right? What they said is, you know, either we can all find agreement in this or this is not something that we want to deploy as a law. And that's the way the English church works too, right? So it not only is attractive to the kind of personality that is like mine, it's also the most ancient biblical model. Jesus did not sit over the apostles like a pope. He kept telling them, I serve you. I got on my knees. I washed your feet. Right? I want you to be servants to each other and to your people the way that I was a servant to you. I gave my life for you guys. And so, you know, a church that, that takes its leadership seriously in that regard wants its leaders to be the servants of the people wants its bishops to be the servants of its priests, and wants its priests and deacons to be the servants of their parish. Okay. So, so because we're based on common law, right, we don't have to, we're not so concerned with saying, you sinned. And if we don't punish you, somebody else will sin. Okay. What we can be more concerned with is, how did we deal with the last guy that did this? Or matter of fact, how do we deal with the 10 last guys that did this? Right? And that's the way our own legal system in America is, right? That, you know, we, we have laws, but when you go to court, you have a jury who's, and a judge whose job is to say, you know, did, first, did they break the law or not? But second, now that they did, how do we handle that? Is this one that we handle with mercy? Is this one that we handle harshly? Do we, need, do we dole out the death penalty for this guy? And then for this guy, we give him manslaughter and, and two years in jail because the character of what they did is very, very different. My friend, Father Guy, came from an English royal family. His, you know, his father was a lord, and they had the lands and, uh, and you know, Including in the, included in their land where all the farms people worked, but also forests where there was hunting. And they, they were, you know, because they were the royal family, they had the right to go hunting. And they appointed a sheriff, right? 
and the sheriff's job was to keep people from poaching on their land. And he said there was this one guy that always got caught poaching, you know. The, 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 sh the sheriff would be jotting down the road around the forest where the, the deer were, or the, or the rabbits, or wherever they were doing, and, and would say, you know, Fred, I see you have, you know, five rabbits hanging over your shoulder. And Fred would go, what? Are you kidding me? There are rabbits on my shoulder? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> and of course, Fred was out hunting for his family that was relatively poor. And Fred was a drunk, you know, so he didn't work and his family suffered. So the sheriff would put Fred in jail for poaching, but then he would deliver the rabbits to the family. Right, to make sure that they got the food, right? So, so that's the precedent, the idea of using precedent. It's not only is something right or wrong, but what's the best way for us to deal with this in a way that's best for the individual and for the community, right? We want to keep Fred from poaching, but we also want to make sure that his family gets the rabbits. That makes sense to everybody? So in the Anglican Church, we have our, our corporate confession before communion. We all say, you know, confess our sins, and the priest gives absolution and says, you know, that your sins are forgiven you, uh, and that, uh, you know, and that, that you, know, you, are, you are prepared now in your heart to come and receive Christ in the communion because you've been forgiven. A lot of people don't know this. We also do private confession. Okay. Private confession is, especially when someone is so troubled by their sin, they need to talk about it. Or they don't know whether what they did was a sin, or they know what they did was a sin, but it was, you know, they had terrible decisions to make. You know, for example, you know, the person who was raped, you know, and is caused a consequence is now pregnant and having a baby and, you know, is trying to deal with abortion or they already had the abortion, right? So, do, you know, is our goal to brand that person with a big scarlet A and kick them out of the church? No, what they did was wrong, okay? But what they did, it, there were considerations that went into it and what we really want is for them to, you know, to recognize that what they did is wrong but to come back into the church to be supported by their church family, to be put in an environment where, you know, they're going to be safe and when they start their family again, they can have the community around them that lifts them up and holds them together and helps that family to, to be strong and to, and to be a good Christian family and to be a blessing. And so, you know, we're not just so concerned with what the sin is and how many Hail Marys you have to say in order to get relief. Our goal is, okay, you did this, I understand why you did it. This is why God says that this is wrong, okay? And, and now we need to bring you back into the family. Now we need to bring you back into our community and we need to help you to be in a position to live a life that is at, you know, more peaceful, more graceful, you know? And to, you know, we, you know, you're gonna meet that baby again when you go to heaven, well, you know, so. You know, what we need for right, right now is for you to be prepared to deal with, you know, how you can do that with love and embrace that child when you see them instead of shame and guilt. Okay? And that's the way we work through these things. And the, tr 
truth, and that they can have their own truth. So certainly, you know, our understanding of things like addiction, mental health issues has grown, right? I mean, so there were people that had mental health issues when Jesus was around, right? And, and they called them possessed, right? And the way they, they fixed that was to do an exorcism. We do medications or we, you know, put people in an institution. You know, we, we, we have adapted uh, the way that we deal with mental illness and we understand that ba some behaviors are tied to these conditions, right? And so part of, a, part of a priest's job is to understand the circumstances, you know. Okay, yes, this person did something that was destructive. You know, what's their state of mind? You know, could they help themselves? You know, uh, was it their intention to be harmful? And then you have to modify the way that you deal with them based on their state of mind, all right? And, you know, wrong is wrong, so, you know, there's still God's law and what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong, but, but then what do you do about it when someone's on the wrong side of God's law? How do, how do we get them to a place where they're back on the correct side of God's law, where they can be living correctly? And so, yes, I mean, it, it's very different today and, and in terms of how we do this. Feeding him. Yeah. We, no, we just, you know, that it's right. I mean, it is one of the real problems with a society that doesn't have a moral code, right? Where everything is relative and everything is true. Is that. You know, what, what's, that's not crazy, that's just me, and I have the right to be whatever I want to be, even if it hurts somebody else, right? So, so yes, I mean, you know, it probably, human nature has always been complex. People have always dealt with very difficult issues in their lives, and, you know, people have always rationalized how, you know, their behavior when they want to do something that is contrary to God's law. And, you know, we have different ways of, of dealing with it. I mean, I, you know, in your, in your Vietnamese village, the fact that, you know, yes, the person was restrained, but, but that village fed him and took care of him and made sure that he was okay, right? So, so each culture has their own way of dealing with it. And for us, you'll notice that I don't stand up there and preach about a particular kind of sin very often. You know, that, that when people are really struggling with big sins, the better way I prefer is they come talk to me, all right? And let's talk about your life. And I, you know, I believe abortion is wrong, period. All right, that's taking a life that God created. St. Paul took a life that God created, and he still became one of the great apostles, all right? He repented, he changed his life, and... He got into the Christian community and became a leader of it. And so just because you have done something wrong in your life doesn't mean that you don't have a ministry and that you don't have a place in, in a church. And we have, to, we have to help you to understand why it's wrong, understand why you did it so we can get you in a better place than you are, and then find a way to put you in a, in, a, in a community that can support you in living a good life and a godly life, right? And so I, in the Anglican Church, we have both things. I don't have a confessional box, okay? Because the purpose of a confessional box in the Roman Church is to remind everybody that 
it's not the priest does not forgive sins right he sits inside that box but he's speaking for god and what he's you know what gets said inside that box is you know stays inside that box and never can be shared with anybody and you're talking through the priest to god and god is giving you forgiveness that's the same understanding that we have in the anglican church except i think that we don't believe that i have to go hide in a box so you know that i'm not god i think you can look at me <laughs> and say no he's not god you know not today <laughs> right and so so we can have these conversations and you know and and, and because i have a family and i have had jobs and i have lived in the world and I have children and grandchildren, you know, I, I can talk to you both as a person and as a priest, right? You know, with my experiences to help, you know, with, to, to help you to understand that I know what you're going through, but also to, you know, to say that, you know, God has instituted this sacrament of forgiveness and reconciliation so that you come past your sins and back into the fellowship, and back into the community of God and his people. How are we doing on time? We've got a few more minutes. These are, th this is a really important element of Anglicanism. We're going to continue on polity of the church next week and talk about the way that both the church overall is organized and how a parish is organized. Uh, but, you know, the foundation of that is you know, what's our culture, what's our background of governing, you know, and then, you know, from that, how do we apply what is the biblical direction that God gave his people in a way that is reflected in the way that the sacrament, especially of confession, is administered and taken care of in our church. That should raise questions. You know, different strokes for different folks. People are, you know, the way the Romans do it isn't wrong. It's right for lots of people. The way that Baptists do it isn't wrong. It's right for lots of people, All right? The way the Methodists deal with, you know, reconciliation is right for lots of people. And, and we don't want to say, you know, take away their cultural, you know, response to the way, to the sin of, you know, the their people and in the world. We do ours this way. And we do ours this way because it's consistent with the way that the apostles did it. It's scripturally consistent. And and I think it treats our congregation with dignity re and respect because we you know we're we want to deal with the reality of your whole life, not just the thing you did wrong without talking about why that happened and how it came about and how we can get you into a better place. All right. Father, you want to close this up with a prayer?